while. It's been a bit since since we've done the whole podcast. A lot has like happened in a bit, but a lot has happened. <laughs> <laughs> One way um, to put it. Yeah, um, I don't know. I feel like for me, preaching is kind of like uh, riding a bicycle, or even if I haven't done it in a while, it's just like oh, you no. just kind of hop back on. No, I, she's like, I don't know. It's just making a sermon. I feel like I've done it before, but podcasting, I'm like super nervous for some reason. Oh, I'm chill. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, I can tell. I can tell that you're I chill. Feel, I just feel at like ease. Yeah, I'm I just, just got to make sure, like, we're I'm ready. Still recording and like, all right, you know what? It all looks good. I it think it's gonna good. work out. All right. All right, then you know what? I, I say that we just go for it. All right. I say we just hop right in. I say that we do this right now. Right now? Let's do it. Right now. All right, guys. Welcome back to The, the Worthy, Worthy Podcast. Podcast. Like we never missed a beat. Never. Today's episode title is... I forgot. Is it Stand <laughs> on Faith? Stand on Faith. Faith. That's this why I was episode, trying to unlock my phone to get it. We're going to be breaking down uh, the most recent sermon that just went up. Uh, if you're on YouTube, it's the video that's right before this. If you're right. on Spotify, it's the podcast that's right before this or any other platform. Mm-hmm. It's whatever's just before. So make sure to go give that a, a listen. Because um, I was pumped up about this one. I was I was really excited to preach oh, this one. Oh, I could one. tell. You know, I've just, I've been, great. I've, I've kind of like, I've, I've, I don't know what happened, but I've just, I've found my, my excitement with preaching again. And, and it's awesome. I love it. I love doing it. That fire in your heart? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, That's what we love to hear. Yeah. And so the next, let's see, four weeks will be, should I announce it or should I just let them be surprised? I think we should tell them what's coming down the pipeline. What's in four weeks, Jaren? Well, next week will be a sermon oh. by Divinity. What? I know. I, sorry, I probably should have told you yeah, earlier. You're, you but scared but, me. When when sorry. do I have to preach? Okay. Yep, but uh, two days. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's and right. And then after That's that right. will be a podcast where we break down Divinity Sermon. After yes. that will be a sermon where I preach. And then after that will be a podcast where we break down that sermon. So we have a ton of videos coming down the pipeline. Uh, we're going to preach those sermons in two days. We're going to record the podcast the following week. But for right nice. now, we're here. Breaking down, stand on, on faith. faith, right? And uh, so, yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead. Let's let's just jump right into it. Well, let's jump right in. And you jumped right in at preaching, and you took us to First Corinthians sixteen thirteen, and you broke it down. It has like, I think four or five parts to this verse. It says, number one, be on guard, stand firm in mm. faith. And that's, I see where you got the top. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Mm. So why this verse? Why would you pick stand on faith with it also saying, be on guard, be courageous, be strong, mm. and do everything in love? Yeah. Well, I mean, this, um, this wasn't even a part of my sermon study. This was just, just for fun. I, um, you know, I, I, there was a time when all my Bible study would come for sermon purposes. And then when I wasn't preaching a sermon, I wouldn't really be in the word that much. So <laughs> I've made it a habit to try to have a consistent time in the Bible. And then when I'm doing a sermon, it's just added on top of, and it's not in replacement of, right. um, and it sounds like a lot, but that's actually more of a healthy habit. So that you kind of, no, that's good. Um, and so what I've been doing is I've, uh, started with Paul's letters. I went through first Corinthians Every chapter of that, now I'm going through Romans. After this, I plan to do Hebrews, which is not one of Paul. Uh, just going through some of the New Testament books, right. going kind of like, chap- not even chapter, like verse by verse. And um, I don't like writing in my Bible. It's not like, I'm not saying other people should. Really? I'm just saying that I don't because I get distracted. I write all over No, I know. That and thing. there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with like highlights or writing. There, are, There's nothing wrong. No, I'm just I'm saying playing. for me, like I get distracted oh. because I feel like every time I look at a verse, I don't want to be reminded of the last lesson I learned from it because I feel like every time God brings you back to a scripture, I learn something new. So I I like to try to keep my Bible fresh, which means I have a notebook that I have. And it's literally like one of those middle school notebooks. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll go through and in the margins, I'll write verse one. 
that'll write a note about verse one. Right. Um, or like it starts with like chapter three and then yep. verse one, verse two, verses four through seven. If it's a section, take notes. And yep. it, it is, there's no rules. It's just like whatever jumps out, whatever's interesting. And so I was going through first Corinthians and I got to this verse and I was like, oh man, this is kind of a cool verse. So I just started writing it out in my notebook. Mm-hmm. And instead of writing stand firm in the faith, <clears> I wrote the first part, the second part, then I wrote stand on faith. And I wrote it and I was like, oh man, that's really cool. Then I look back at the text. I'm like, that's not actually what it said. Oh, no, but say that. <laughs> but, but it stuck with me. It stuck with me. And it stuck with me enough to, to be a sermon title. Because um, it ended up going with the theme of... I mean, I don't want to spoil it, but if you've already heard the message, Spoiler then, alert. Um, you know that the story is about Jesus who heals a man uh, and gives him the ability to, to not only to walk, but for the first time in his life to stand. God tells him to, or Jesus tells him to get up. Um, and so he stands. And so I, I like hmm. the sermon title of Stand on Faith. Um, so yeah, there's a story behind it. There's, right. there's the message. And I was going to point out just the key little principle. I have my little study Bible. And it did say, stand in faith. And it's saying right here that that is the good news that they've been taught from the beginning. The gospel has brought them salvation, and they should be standing in mm. faith, bringing salvation. But in this case, when we learn from, um, was it John 5 of the paralyzed man, when Jesus came up to him, not only did he tell him, you know, you need to rise, but he said, pick up your mat, and he said to walk, mm. and we'll be going into that um, later, <laughs> but yeah, he said stand in faith, like salvation and stuff, so I think that was a really cool point there. I wrote down, stand firm in the faith, we got to walk and live as if the word of this book is true, mm-hmm. and you had two questions with that. You said, how would your life change if Jesus can really do what he says he can do? Mm-hmm. And that question just like, it kind of just got me for a moment <laughs> because I'm, as I'm reading through New Testament right now, I've, um, I just kind of laugh at the disciples sometimes <laughs> because like, they'll be like, just for example, Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? And the disciples... Um, I can't remember exactly whose names, but like one of them was like, well, I don't know what we're going to do, Jesus. Um, with that country accent. Yes. I don't know what we're going to do, Jesus. I don't know what you're going to do. Um, all these people are out here in this big <laughs> old crowd and there's yeah, no food. No biscuits around here. Like, what do you want me to do? Go into town and try to buy food? It's too late. And then mm-hmm. I think it was Andrew, um, who brought up this little boy and it was like, Okay, this boy has, you know, some fish mm. and some bread. Mm. Um, here you go. Take it, Lord. Do whatever. And Jesus was like, all right, let me bless the food. And then it was multiplied and they had leftovers. Um, but, like, some of the disciples just didn't believe that um, Jesus could even do this. And then you move on later in the text and you see Jesus walking on water. And then the disciples out on the boat freaking out. And they're like, Oh, Jesus, what are you doing out in the water? And they're freaking out. And I'm like, disciples, did you not even see where Jesus just, um, you know, multiplied right. food? Mm-hmm. And now you, you can't believe that he's walking on water? And now you can't believe that he just healed like a man from being paralyzed? Like, it just blows my mind. I guess how, what's the nice way to put it? How Innocent, quick we are to forget. Or quit, Yeah. We just forget what Jesus can do. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the time frame of the Bible and how it's written, but <laughs> I mean, maybe they, maybe it was some days after and they just forgot feeding the 5,000. <laughs> Who knows? But it, there's got to be like, you got to remember some truth in it. Yeah. I'm uh, uh, actually, I'm working on my next sermon right now, kind of a part two in a sense called Walk on Faith. And I'm talking about hmm. the Israelites. <laughs> And um, I talk about how the Israelites doubt what God can do, even though he just, uh, when they were trying to enter the promised land, even though right before that, he delivered them from Egypt. He sent the plagues. He parted the waters. He gave them a pillar to, to guide them. And, um, and it's so interesting how as soon as we draw our focus away, we forget what God can do. Mm. And um, 
Yeah, and so I, I, I phrased the question pretty intentionally because I, I I could have said something along the lines of like, um, I don't know, how I wanted to to make it very clear that like there will be change if you accept the truth about what mm. Jesus can do. Like, how would your life change? Yeah. It, 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 it's not a like it's not a thing where you can stay the same and learn the truth or where you can learn the truth and stay the same like if you truly believe that Jesus can do what he can do your life will change in some way right and so I wanted to bring that out and say how would it change and I want to dive into like what does that look like what does that mean what what does that mean to you and wherever your walk is and it's the same question for the second one yeah how would your life change? Because your life will be different if you truly accept if Jesus is who he says he is. Right. And as Christians, we may say like, okay, I, I believe that that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for my sins. But everything else that comes with that, that also means that we trust who he is. He's a provider. Mm-hmm. And if he's a provider, that means that we're not going to worry about where our next meal is going to come from. Mm. If he's a healer, that means that we need to believe that he has the power to heal. And that kind of goes back to, can he right. do what he says he can do? And these different characteristics, it's much wider. If truly accepting the identity of Jesus is not a change that can be compartmentalized in our lives. Right. We can't put Jesus in a box. It's and just something have one that affects part. every part of us. Right. In a sense, and everything that we do and how we live that out. So I just wanted to ask the question how would your life change if Jesus really could do what he says he can do? And how would your life change if Jesus really was who he says he was? So I like that. And I think if, I mean, we truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is, well, at first, the disciples, you look at them and they just stop what they're doing from being a tax collector or a fisherman or whatever they're doing in their walk of life, and they just follow Jesus. So what does that look like for us if we just stop what we're doing and stop mm-hmm. like the temptations and the distractions and the sins that we were doing beforehand, and we're like, all right, Jesus, I'm going to 100% follow you. I mean, it's going to be a transition for sure. Change is not always easy. Even when we go through like hard things, it's not always easy to say oh god you're still faithful even though this tragic thing happened oh god i'm still gonna praise you even though this thing happened that and being able to praise him for that takes time it's not something we can do overnight so i mean i'm the disciples had to learn about that (laughs) (laughs) i think at first it's probably hard to follow him but gradually, they see Jesus for who he is and learn more about him. They're like, They're just astonished. They're mm-hmm. Like, wow, yeah. you truly are the son of God. And they learn that. All right. So we're going to jump in the text? We're going to jump in the text. Jump in the text. And we're at five. Oh, we're not at five. We're at John <laughs> 5, starting at 1. Right. And it says, Jesus heals a lame man by the pool. Kind of a hint. But anyways. <laughs> spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. This is what the story is about. But if you watched the preaching, earlier, then, then you wouldn't know. Anyways. But before this, it says, Sometimes later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, was a pool. Wait, I don't know. Stop right there. I might. I thought he was going to a festival. He's just going to go swimming in a pool. <laughs> I'm kind of confused, Jared. <laughs> I'll just go to a festival. You know what? I'll just take a quick swim. That, that party in the pool area. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, they partied in that pool area. Oh boy. Um, but yeah, um, I, whenever I I look at a text, I always try to find something that's not like it's not the first thing that you think about. And so when I was looking at this, uh, I was just kind of going slowly, and it's like Jesus went to Jerusalem for a festival. But then it starts talking about him going to a pool. And it's like, okay, I thought he went to Jerusalem for a festival. Why is he going for, to a pool? So if you look Confused. into it, it doesn't, we, we aren't exactly <laughs> sure what festival it is. Most scholars believe that it's the Passover. Passover came with meals and different mm. preparations for the meals. And there was a, a, a kind of a ceremony at the, at the table where you would remember what God did with the history. So like there were steps to the celebration of the Passover. 
So Jesus had things to do when he went to Jerusalem. Um, he had things to do with his disciples, with his family, if he could, if they were there. And so that's why I found it interesting. Like, okay, he went there for the festival, but now he ends up at this pool. Hmm. And, um, and I just looked at that and I was like, man, I, I love the heart of God. That's never too busy in what he's doing to find a lost, a hurting, or a broken person. Well, how do we know that? We didn't even read. Well, because <laughs> he went to the pool that was filled with people. I thought he was partying in the lame. pool. <laughs> He's not partying in the pool. <laughs> I mean, if they if they've seen the the sermon, there. I'm joking. I'm joking. Right. Yeah, we we know. So he went to the pool, and it says here there is a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One was there who had been ill for thirty eight years, and this is when he dialed down and had compassion. For one man that he went to the pool. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? Do you know what the man said? Yeah. And he says, um, yes. No. (laughs) He don't want to get well? He said, sir, the man replied, um, Oh, man, I'm trying to remember exactly how it goes. I have no one to carry me into the pool when the water is stirred. Every time I try, someone goes down in front of me. Something along those lines? Yeah, you got it. Um, And so I think when I read that the first time, the emotion that came through was a form of desperation. Hmm. Like imagine being in such a state where... (laughs) You can't even say yes. And the first thing you default to is like, dude, I've been here for 38 years. He's like, I am losing my mind. I've tried to go down into the pool because we have in some, some mystery verses, some, some hidden verses that right. people believed and they would hang around this pool because they believed when the water was stirred that it was an angel. And so the first one at the pool would be healed. And so this man believed that so much that he's been sitting there for years. And he says, sir, I've been trying to go down time and time and time again, but every time I try, I can't move. <laughs> and so I can't get in there because I don't have anybody to help me. And so right. I saw a bunch of parts that are just like, he's desperate. He's alone. He's been trying. It's not working. He can't do it. He can't find healing. He can't find deliverance. And he's been trying for so long. It's a point of, of, of desperation. And so Jesus comes along and asks him, do you want to be well? And the only thing he can say is like, I've been trying to. <laughs> he's, not even, he's not even in the mindset of like thinking, yes, I want to be well. It's just like he just goes back to the years and years and years that he's been trying and nothing's been working. And so he probably has no hope that it's going to work now. Right. Like he's probably not looking at this random man that walked up to him being like, this is, this is the cure. Because he's tried everything else. And every time he's had hope that maybe this will work, he's been let down. I've been there, you know, in certain situations Mm -hmm. where I was trying to get out of a funk or I was trying to finally break a habit. I was trying to whatever. And and I would try this and I'm like, oh my word, this is going to work this time. And then I'd be let down and I'd try this person and then I'd be let down. And, and, and it's like, you try all these different things. And eventually when something new comes along, you just lose hope for it altogether. Mm. And so when Jesus comes up to this man and says, do you want to be well? He's not even thinking healing. He's thinking that he's asking probably a pretty stupid question. Um, but even in that, you can tell that he's desperate to find something. <laughs> desperate to find something because he's been trying. And what has he found? Nothing. So, yeah. I don't think Jesus knew that. I think that's why he probably went to that pool one day instead of going to the festival and having fun, doing all the traditional (laughs) stuff. He went to a pool, a pool filled with all these ill people, and he chose that man because he saw that he's been trying. And 
And I think he saw past the excuse and he just wanted to heal him. And so Jesus' next word in this was, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And it says at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. And like, I think that's just a testimony in itself. Like even at times when we go through like things that are just unimaginable to us and we don't want to get out. God's like, come on, just let's go. Just pick up your mat. Just Let's walk together. Let's do this life together. I know it's hard in a moment or a season. I know these couple of weeks have not been what you expected. I know. That's why I'm here. That's why I came. I was always here. Just You just got to get up. Just get up. Stand on faith and lean on me. Lean in on me. Walk with me. You don't have to be on that mat. You don't have to be on that ground any longer. And I think we can all relate to this in one sense. And yeah, that's why we make up excuses. Because we don't know where else to turn to. And God's like, I'm right here. Stand with me. So I love that line. And at once the man was cured. If we truly believe that God created humans, then part of that theology is the purpose behind why he made them. And actually, I'm reading, I'm in a social psychology class, and and Hmm. the, the Christian lens of social psychology keeps coming up. And one of the biggest things is God's purpose in creating humans. And it was two things. One, to live in union with God and community with others. And so I have a firm belief that every person is created with a God-sized hole. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And they try to fill it with things that feel good, like how much money can I make and how many followers can I have and how many stages can I find and uh, what kind of job can I get, whatever. You try to fill it with something that's going to try to fill you when in reality we were created with a need for God. And so we try to fill with all these other external things, but... And so when God, when Jesus came to this man, he said, I know that you've been looking and searching for something for your entire life. Here I am. He didn't even recognize it right. at first. <laughs> but, but Jesus said, I, I know how desperate you've been. Here I am. What you need, I am. And so then Jesus tells him, all right, pick up your mat, get up, and walk. And I think in the sermon, I break down the the significance of of each of those lines. Like, pick up your mat. Like, that was pretty much his house. (laughs) That's where he'd been living for years. And God says, you're not going back to that mat anymore. He said, get up, which means that the one thing that you've not been able to do, you can now do. And then he says, and walk. And I think that last part is is my favorite one because when Jesus says walk, he's he's not just telling a man who hasn't been able to walk to to just go walk. Like there's so much more behind it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've been waiting 38 years without the ability to walk, your first steps are not like it's not like a normal step for someone who's right. been able to walk for their entire life. I think where I'm getting at is this that. Uh, we were listening to a really good chapel service earlier today. And the speaker said, your ministry is you is as unique as you are. Mm-hmm. He said, your ministry is, is you is, is how God created you. God gave you a special purpose. And it might not be preaching and singing like we see pastors and worship leaders do. Uh, and you know, I, I, sometimes I go to like the, the corny example of like, if you can smile, go be a church greeter. Like if you can cook, go make church concession stand or whatever. But but like people have have gifts and, and mm-hmm. interests and things that just light them on fire and and God's saying like I want to use that and so when I think he says walk to this man who's not been able to walk what he's doing is saying like hey I want you to be an ambassador for my kingdom 
So I want you to walk because everyone who sees you walking is going to know that you had an encounter with God because that's the only way that you could have been healed. They've known that you haven't been able to walk for 38 years. So when they see you walk in this deliverance, and I'm talking to people at home as well, when they see you walking in this deliverance from this thing that you've been stuck in for so long, they're going to know the only explanation is that you met God. And so when Jesus tells him to walk, what he's really saying is go live out the calling that I made specifically for you, that you were only able to find when I showed up in your life. I believe that God has a calling for every person that he made. He made them with a calling. But we can only find it when we lean into God, like you were saying. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think it's our responsibility to draw closer to God and he will draw closer to us. I think it's our responsibility to lean in, to focus on God. And then once we have our, our, our minds set on him, then our calling will flow out of who we are. Even if it's just something as simple as walking for us. Sometimes that's the calling that we have. And so I just think it's a beautiful thing that that God is able to do in this situation where it's, he's not just telling a man to walk. He's, he's changing a man's life and he's giving them a completely new purpose and identity. And he's finally giving him what he's been wanting for so long. It's beautiful. And I'm sure that when he was told to get up and walk and he was cured, I think that was a way different perspective of, of how he thought he was going to get healed <laughs> he thought he was going to get healed by the stirred water uh, with the angel and if he ever made it down to the pool then that's how he's going to be healed but when he was healed by god that was a perspective that he didn't think he was going to be healed with and i think when we finally do walk with god it's going to be a different way than that we thought was going to be different. Like, I'll tell you, like, this new semester, and this is going to be my next mm. preaching video, but this new semester I thought was going to be, like, just more on fire for God, was just going to do ministry, and it was mm. just going to be amazing. But when we started the semester, I picked up, you know, more classes, and they're challenging. I picked up injury, and I can't run for my uh, track and track team. And... Like, I just got so bogged down with everything and losses in the family that I just, it was a different expectation than what I had originally planned. And I'm like, I had a, had a come to Jesus moment. I'm like, Lord, this is not what I expected this semester. (laughs) This, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do right now. I'm at a loss. And... I did not find the way to go until I started to get back to him and started listening to him and being endowed back into him and fixed my eyes on him and really just standing on faith with him. Hmm. But in the moment of everything that was going on and having this new expectation to be disappointed that it didn't happen, and all these other things happened, and I was just kind of in a state of sadness, like disappointment. Like, I just did not know what to do. A loss. I was just at a loss. Um, but when I found God again, when he showed up back into my life in the chapel services, I'm like, oh, wait, this is God. This is him again. He never left me. I might have left him for a moment. And I didn't feel him. That was why. But God was right there. And I hear him again. And it was hard to get back to that. But I was like that man in that sense. I had to pick up my mat of the disappointing expectation that I have for this new semester. And I just had to refollow God again and stand on that. Because hmm. otherwise, I would have still been on that mat. I would have still been paralyzed on my ground. So, yeah. God, it's not what I thought it was going to look like. It, by no means. Good. I'm like, Lord, what the world? God's going to shatter your plans. 
It says that we can make as many plans as we want to, but the Lord is going to like do his will. He's going to do his way. I cannot remember what verse that is. I know it's somewhere. <clears throat> but I think it's Proverbs. It shows up a few times in Proverbs. Maybe Proverbs we 17. will establish our Definitely plans. Proverbs 19. Man and, establishes plans in heart, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. And that's what it did. So even with like being so disappointed in what I thought was going to happen, and it didn't, God was like, what do you mean, girl? This was part of the plan. What are you talking about? I got you. You're the one that turned away from me and just pout on the ground. Like, what were you doing? And I'm like, sorry, God. I realized that it's all for your plan and all for your purpose. Even the hard times, it's for him. It's like you get to those seasons and you look at God. It's like, God, you lost control. And he's like, no, you did. <laughs> you the one. <laughs> you the one that it, did it. It's not what I thought it was going to look like. And he's like, good, because this was my plan the whole time. And, you know, how quickly we lose sight of God going back to the beginning. Like how quickly we forget right. about his purpose and his plan for our lives and how quickly we just try to take things back into our own hands and say, I want it to look like this. So we make our own picture for the future. When in reality, God's just saying like, Hey, I, I got you. I have you. I'm going to take care of you. So during your preaching, I wrote down some points and this first question like came to mind. It says, can you hear God? Cause the man who was, asked hey you want to be healed and he came up with excuses but then like god just commanded him hey get up and just go walk and he's like okay so that man heard god he was willing to listen and he followed god's command and he did it and he was able to walk without even saying yes he was cured so that brung a second question and it was like what has God commanded us to do? Mm. Have we done it? Are we still doing it? Have we even started? Have we done and there's a new thing? Like what has God commanded you to do or been trying to speak to you to do and you haven't done it? What's that little nudge in your heart for you to do? We was listening to the preacher earlier in the chapel building and it was talking about ministry and it was talking about Right where you are is where you can do your ministry. If you have a smile, smile to someone and go talk to them. If you are a painter, paint the beautiful creation of God. And then, hey, let's have a conversation of, I saw this and this is a beautiful creation of God. And just read through the Psalms because they, they talk about a lot of things like paint of the skies and all of God's beautiful majesties. Let's see. If you love talking and you have good advice and your encouragement, Go have conversations with people. I do that all the time with sitting at people with lunch and just seeing how their day is going. If they're down, i like, are you okay? And they'll be like, I'm fine. And I'm like, are you really okay? And they'll be like, well. And I'm like, oh, I want to hear it. And just be, if you're a listener, then just be a listener and listen to people. But your ministry is who you are, just like you said. If God's commanded you to be here at this moment for wherever you are, if it is at school, if it's at college, if it's at a job, if it's even being a stay-at-home mom, like whatever it is, how can you do ministry for God? How can you do it? Can you read to your children at night little books about the Bible and tell the stories like that? Can you go out to the store? And simply just ask the cashier how their day's going and bring up, hey, this is what God's done in my life. You want to hear about it? I think people are ready and they're raring to hear what we have to offer, what God is ha having to offer through us to them. Um, the preacher is also talking about how the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And it's not talking about the workers, like you said, about pastors or people singing up on stage, but just regular, ordinary people who have a heart for God. That's who he's talking about. The workers are few. So it brings back to the question, what has God commanded you to do? Yeah, I think that... 
God's either telling us to work or to wait. And so if you're in a waiting season, cool, just lean into God. But if you're in a working season, sometimes he just kind of says, go do something. And he might not give you anything else until you go do that first thing. There's been right. times in my life where I knew I had to go do something. And, and I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And I was like, God, why can't I hear you? And it's like, because you don't need to hear anything. Go do what I told you to do two months ago. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but uh, That's funny. <laughs> what? I done told you two months ago. <laughs> I done told you two months. No I'd wonder say, you can't you hear didn't me. You respond to my email. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Don't ignore me like that. But, um. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, oh man, I had like so many things that I was gonna say as you were talking, but um, um, what has God told you to do? Yeah, and you know what? I just want to challenge anyone listening to this that 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 God has a purpose for your life. I remember what I was gonna say. There you go. Um, you know, for me, I want to be a pastor, but. The speaker kind of ripped on podcasts and preachers, which he is like really like, did, and I'm like, dude, that's like my whole shebang <laughs> here. I don't know what else I got. No, I but, know, like, Lord. but 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 I felt like the Holy Spirit was just showing me a picture of of what a successful pastor is, and and it was weird because you know I actually got this image of almost like an old country church, and it was a hmm. pastor who was old and. I don't know. It was kind of like a vision that I had or something. And it was a pastor that was old and he was preaching to a small congregation. And then after he was done preaching, I just got these images where he would go to their houses and he would show up for them and he would ask them how they were doing and he would go out and pray for them. And I realized a successful pastor, it's not about how many people you can get into a building. It's mm. not about how dramatic your speeches can be. It's not about the words that you string together. A successful pastor is someone who shepherds the flock that God mm. entrusts him with. And to shepherd is to go pray for people, to go love people, to go, instead of going to a party, go to the pool like Jesus right. did and, and seek out people that need you. And there are going to be some people that are honestly just fine. Mm -hmm. but not everybody's always fine because you're going to find people that are broken or lost or hurt or hopeless. And those are the people that God's saying, I want to reach them now in their pain. I want to reach them now where they're finally open to knowing that they need me. Mm. And so a successful pastor is anyone who accepts that call. It's not someone who's going to get ordained. It's not someone who's going to work in a church. A successful pastor is someone who's deciding to go after the lost, the hurt, the broken, the hopeless sheep, because that's who God goes after. And so someone who's living out that calling does not have to be preaching. That mm -hmm. Because in, in my, my vision of being a good pastor it wasn't preaching. It was everything after that where he was checking in on people. He was loving people. He's being there for people. He's inviting people over. And he's just been doing that so faithfully. And, and I think that's how you disciple people is just by being someone of love. And then in the right time, you be someone of truth. Mm -hmm. That you be someone of, of timely love. And they'll be very, and then the people who listen will be very open to truth. If I don't have a relationship with someone, they're probably not going to come Dude. to the preaching that, we have on Friday. You stole my point. And so I'm so can, upset. I can ask as many people as I want, but the only way that they're going to get in there is if I build a relationship with them. They need to know that I love them first. And so I've been wrong. I'll admit it. I, I've been wrong. I've, I've, I've been so focused on the preaching and the podcasting because it's so fun, but. I think what God is really calling us to do, the ministry is to just go love on people and to go where God sends and to seek out the people that need him. Because that's what Jesus did. At the right time, he found a broken and a lost person and he left them. Maybe we can't heal someone who can't walk, but what we can do is love someone. And I think that's the calling that we all have. And I was going to say, it all goes back to relationships. Mm -hmm. It all, well, no, <laughs> my phone. It all goes back to relationships. And when you was talking about that pastor, and I was envisioning it, and I'm like, the pastor was not preaching at the pe people's house. He wasn't preaching. 
he just wanted to check in on them and mm-hmm. see how they're doing. It's all about relationship. And I was thinking like, okay, what's recently been on my heart was that all Jesus wants is our hearts to be close to us. And all he wants to be is like PFF. He wants to be best friends for life. He wants to be in relationships where we talk to him every single day, 24 seven prayer with him. He wants to be walking with class with us. He wants to be at our job with us. He wants to be working out with us. He wants to be in the Bible and the word with us. He wants to be at church on Sundays. He wants to be with every single distraction and temptation that we go through. So we won't be able to go through those temptations and distractions. God wants to be with us with everything that we're going through. And if we establish a relationship with him, that's the first commandment is to love God. The second commandment is to love others. And how do we love others? We've got to establish that relationship with them. And that is giving them quality time. I was thinking, I'm like, people are not going to go to preaching and they're not going to go to invites unless you have a relationship with them. And then they'll go. We can ask people, hey, I want you to come to the preaching because it's going to be super amazing. You're going to hear such a great word. But, I mean, if we haven't been talking to them in weeks, if we haven't a relationship with them in weeks, then they're going to make up excuses not to come, not to call anyone out. But, like, they're like, they're really like girl, I haven't talked to you in two weeks. you just trying to invite me to preach and just invite me to preach. And, like, I'm not going to come because I'm not. I mean, we haven't been able to – we haven't talked in, like, a couple of days, you know. And I was going to go down somewhere else with that. But the point is, I don't know what I was talking about. I was going to talk about the man and how he, he came up with the excuse. Because he didn't know Jesus. He w- didn't have a relationship with him. I wonder why he came up with all these excuses of trying to be healed. Because he didn't have that relationship with him. He didn't have that trust. He didn't have that bond. He didn't have the love. But Jesus showed that compassion with him. Established a relationship that he is going to know with Jesus the rest of his life. Because that was the game changer. Once we have an established relationship with Jesus, then we can go out and have a good relationship with others. And be able to minister with them. But it starts with God and it goes out to others. I like what you said. God wants to be in the word with you. God wants to work out with you. God wants to walk with you. God wants to, in every moment, God wants to be with you. So are we ready to close? Yeah. Then let me close with this. In every moment, with every breath, God wants to be with you. Let him. Invite him in. Be very intentional about keeping your eyes on God as you walk throughout your day and every part of it. Because if you lose sight of God, you're going to forget about the people that need to be loved. Mm. And that's why we're here. To keep our eyes on God and to reach the people that need to be loved. Amen. So with that, I think... We're out. Just a little reminder. (laughs) Podcast merch is... Um, Up for sure, go. Up and available. We have Worthy Podcast pillows. That's right. And, you know, t-shirts and crew necks and hoodies and stickers. Uh I love my stickers. But anyways, we have that out today in the link in bio. Please go and check it out. It's amazing. Yeah. And also, like and subscribe to the video. And I think that is it. That's all we got. All right. Peace. Peace.